In 1920, John B. Watson, a renowned psychologist, and Rosalie Rayner, his assistant and eventual wife, decided to combine love, science, and a fair bit of cluelessness in an experiment that would go down in history as the Little Albert Experiment. The idea was bold, the execution debatable, and the results as ethically murky as a midsummer mud puddle. Thus, in a story one might mistake for the beginning of a Dickensian epic, Little Albert's fate was sealed. So, today on Weird History, hide your kids from the Little Albert Experiment. But before things get too far, make sure you've subscribed to the Weird History channel. After that, leave us a comment and let us know what other psychological studies you want to hear about. Now, what was worse for guys named Albert? Meeting J. Robert Oppenheimer or the following experiment? John B. Watson, perhaps inspired by Ivan Pavlov's famed experiment with salivating dogs and ringing bells, thought he'd take the idea of conditioned response in a different direction. Why condition hunger when you could condition terror? And why test on a dog when you could traumatize a child instead? Apparently, he felt Pavlov just hadn't gone far enough. The goal was as clear as it was questionable, to condition fear in a small child and see what happened, ideally without getting anyone hurt. The test subject was a nine-month-old baby nicknamed Little Albert. The setup was straightforward. Little Albert was introduced to a series of innocuous white furry objects, most notably a rat. As Albert reached toward the furry critter, Watson struck a metal bar with a hammer right behind the infant. The baby was, predictably, startled and uncertain as to what had happened. This process was repeated until Albert began to connect white furry objects with a loud, frightening noise, causing him to react with terror at the mere sight of anything that had both fur and a bright hue. The test was technically a success. Little Albert, once blissfully unaware of the terrifying aspects of rabbits, cotton balls, or Santa Claus masks, was now properly conditioned to find anything white and fluffy as terrifying as anyone's worst fear. And Watson kept observing Albert's newly acquired phobia, apparently oblivious to the ethical quagmire into which he was sinking. To call the experiment unscientific would be like calling a volcano a bit warm. Ideally, scientific experiments should include parameters like objective measures, control groups, and a sample size larger than one terrified infant. Alas, Watson and his assistant, Rosalie Rayner, skipped past all that, embracing instead a style of personal observation that feels strangely like guesswork. There were no precise metrics, no scales, and no control group of other babies with which to compare their results. In short, little Elbert's fear was only being measured against itself. When Watson recorded his findings, he was thrilled to note that the conditioning had worked. Albert was visibly upset by white, furry things, which was enough proof for Watson to declare victory. Yet to any budding researcher, the celebration would have seemed a bit premature. Experiments are always more than the initial hypothesis. They are the culmination of elimination and repeated effort. What if Albert was just having a bad day? What if he was already predisposed to dislike the color white? What if the testing environment itself was having a greater effect on Albert's reactions than the sudden loud noise? Watson's reports didn't answer any of those questions, instead opting for a summary approach to his findings that drew questionable conclusions based on very thin evidence. After concluding that Albert was thoroughly conditioned to loathe all things white and fluffy, Watson and Rayner just kind of stopped. They ended the experiment, making no effort to reverse the conditioning, assuming that Albert's color-based terror would simply wear off over time. Much like the tests themselves, this assumption was not based on any scientific evidence. Little Albert's mother reportedly packed up and fled town, presumably afraid that Watson would hunt them down for another experiment, like mad scientists do tend to do. Watson's parting words suggested that Albert would simply grow out of his fears after experiencing some of life's rough and tumble. This sentiment is perhaps better suited to things like skinned knees or stolen lunch money, but at least he made an attempt to be his version of reassuring. In any case, Albert was gone. The experiment was done, and Watson's controversial experiment would be filed away in the great catalog of scientific missteps. During his experimentation, Watson waxed poetic about the exemplary health of little Albert, one of the best-developed youngsters ever brought to the hospital. Watson noted in his 1920 paper, citing the boy's unflappable demeanor as proof of his suitability for the experiment. 
But it wasn't long before scholars began to poke holes in Watson's rosy description. Some suggest Elbert may have had developmental delays or neurological issues, raising a massive red flag that would impact the results of any tests. Obviously, this possibility is something a reputable researcher would have eliminated before beginning any experiment. But Reputable and John B. Watson have rarely occupied the same sentence. Watson wasn't around to address these allegations. And what's more, he burned all his notes on the experiment before his death, like what mad scientists do tend to do. It was a dark time for child welfare and research. There was no such thing as informed consent. If you took part in an experiment, you just had to trust that the researchers weren't lying to you about what they were doing. It wasn't until decades later that psychology, spurred by stories like Little Alberts, began to seriously consider the ethical implications of involving infants in this type of study. Psychologists across the world eventually agreed that babies are, in fact, terrible test subjects for fear conditioning. A child is just beginning to make associations at that stage and is unable to articulate any kind of complex thought, so placing one in a behavioral conditioning study has little scientific value. The only thing Watson was accomplishing with his experiment was scaring the hell out of a random baby. The American Psychological Association would eventually instate guidelines aimed specifically at keeping babies and other unwitting participants from being subjected to terror for the sake of science, presumably hoping to never encounter another case like Elbert's again. Sorry, Bill Nye. Sometimes science doesn't rule. Due to Watson's meticulous and quite literal attempts to burn all bridges behind him, Little Albert's true identity remains as shadowy as a Bigfoot sighting. But there are theories. Some researchers believe Albert was Douglas Merite, a child with hydrocephalus who tragically died young. This, of course, only added fuel to the ethical dumpster fire. What if Watson had knowingly traumatized a terminally ill child? If he had known, we have no doubt he would have addressed such a gross ethical oversight by saying, ah, what can you do? In 2014, a group of Canadian researchers suggested another possibility. Little Albert may have been William Albert Barger, a man who lived into his 80s and, most notably, had a lifelong fear of dogs, no matter the color of their coat. Although this hasn't been completely verified. The stories diverge, the mysteries multiply, and the scientific community remains split over which Albert, if either, was really the unfortunate child in Watson's experiment. It's also possible that nobody wants to claim little Albert as their child because nobody wants to be seen as the parents who signed their baby over to Dr. John the Potbanger. But there are no records of Albert's folks. So it's unlikely we'll ever know the full circumstances of what led them to subject their baby to Watson's experiment. Regardless of the details, one fact stands clear. Watson's legacy endures if only in the cautionary tales told to psychology students. In the wake of Little Albert's eerie legacy, psychology went through something of an existential crisis. What did it mean to be a scientist? Was anything permissible in the pursuit of knowledge? The academic world slowly agreed that ethics mattered and that perhaps children shouldn't be subjected to frightening experiments for posterity's sake. Modern researchers now know to avoid traumatizing infants as much as possible and to find less potentially harmful ways to conduct conditioning experiments. Furthermore, Watson's notorious endeavor inspired the creation of the APA's Code of Ethics, which, despite not being formally established until 1953, effectively did away with the Wild West approach to science favored by Watson and many others. Rather than confirming Watson's theories, the Little Albert experiment demonstrated the need for ethical research standards, regulation, and reliable methodologies in scientific study. We may never know for sure who Albert was, but his story had a permanent effect on the entire world. Dr. John B. Watson, meanwhile, left psychology behind for a successful career as an advertising executive, like a mad scientist would. So what do you think? Was the Little Albert experiment justified? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.